picture this like i'm i'm in my first apartment in new york city five bedroom apartment with four of my roommates from michigan not a true five bedroom it's a true two bedroom <laughs> meaning three of the bedrooms were on the interior of the building no window yeah. i was in one of those rooms because my overprotective mom told me if i had one of the bedroom the the windowed bedrooms that a burglar would climb up the fire escape which the window faced <laughs> and would mug me in my sleep <laughs> so i had this windowless bedroom i would get up at 5 15 every morning to go work out at morgan stanley would get to the trading desk at 6 30 would work from 6 30 to 7 30 at night would get home a call like around eight o'clock and would spend the rest of the day on morning brew so i was definitely burnt out i also had these really mixed feelings where i was like this is strange i'm loving what i'm spending my time doing between eight o'clock and 11 30 way more than what i'm doing during the day and so ultimately you know it was call it eight months of every day leaving work calling my mom being like i don't know what to do I'm going to have to make a decision between Morning Brew and Morgan Stanley at some point. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Powers, and I want to thank you so much for joining me today on the Fort Podcast. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. And if you've enjoyed this show, I would be super grateful if you would follow it on Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you're listening on. And if on Apple, it would mean a lot if you'd leave a rating or review. And last but not least, you can check all these episodes out on YouTube. So thank you again for joining me and enjoy the show. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. I've been pumped about this. Let's just get started with kind of your evolution into starting Morning Brew uh, all the way dating back to your college days. Yeah. So um, Austin, uh, Reef, and myself started Morning Brew when we were students at the University of Michigan. Um, I was a senior at the time. This was back in 2015. He was a sophomore. Uh, and um, I had started writing uh, a newsletter that was called Market Corner. And basically, it was like the OG Morning Brew that I was writing for students that I was helping to prepare for job interviews. I also sent it to family members. And basically, it was just like a crappy PDF that I had converted from a Microsoft Word template. I would write you know, the top five business news stories that I thought the college student would care about, would write uh, an interview question of the day, a stock pitch of the day, an activist investor of the day. I would compile it, put it into a PDF, send it as an attachment to um, an email to about 45 people. And over a month or two of writing this thing, this market corner, it probably grew from, let's call it 45 to 250 readers. And while that wasn't a very large absolute number, uh, it was a big deal because it was impossible to sign up for this newsletter. If you wanted to sign up for market corner, you had to hit me up and be like, hey, heard about your business roundup. Can you add me to your listserv? And I would have to manually put in your email address. There was no website. And so that told me there was appetite. I was like, I want to take this a little bit more seriously. Sent out an email to my 250 subscribers saying, hey, I'm looking to make this a little bit more legit. Does anyone want to help out? Austin Reef, who was a reader at the time, reached out to me and was like, I have ideas for how to make this better. Let's talk. Austin and I chatted in the business school at Michigan. And you know, that was the conversation that changed everything. And, you know, the kind of like the TLDR on our conversation was. Austin, the way Austin's brain worked was kind of like a first of its kind for me in my experiences with people. Meaning like when I was writing Market Corner in the beginning, everyone was patting me on the back saying I was doing a great job. Austin was the complete opposite. He basically tore apart this newsletter when we <laughs> met in person in a respectful way. Yeah, And I just loved how linear of a thinker he was. He was a very different thinker from me. Uh, I'm not linear uh, in thinking. I am kind of like a divergent thinker. He's a convergent thinker. And um, I real like <laughs> I found his brain to be awesome. He was an <laughs> awesome guy. And so we started working together on the brew. And what's funny is we actually started with four co-founders. Um, and we're so <laughs> lucky in retrospect that the other two just decided they weren't nearly as interested. And so they stopped working on it. Yeah. Because, you know, now knowing what we know, it would have been such a shit show if we basically had four <laughs> of the exact same person yep. running the business. Like it was four people who were like Northeast Jews from 
uh, New York and New Jersey and Maryland <laughs> who had the same background in business. None had like tech, content, any sort of differentiated skill. Uh, like imagine four of the same people running a business like that. It, it would not have worked out. And did they, how quickly did it take them to bow out? Within six months. Yeah. yeah. One person, it took uh, two months. The other person, it took six months. And the person who took six months, basically they had to decide, did they want to keep working on the brew or did they want to go work in finance? And they decided that they wanted to work in finance. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things also you learn pretty early on is like, you just really have to like enjoy what you're working on. And and if you don't, you're just going to burn out because it, you, you spend far too much time and there's far too much pain associated with building <laughs> that like you really, you really have to like it. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Uh, back to that conversation with Austin and I've talked to Austin before, but, uh, we didn't talk about this. Do you remember any of the highlights of that conversation? Like what ideas he had that, that kind of struck a nerve with you? I think, um, honestly, it was less about the specific feedback. Like I think he had, uh, given some feedback about, uh, the tone of the writing. He had given some feedback about like whether I should do a stock pitch or not. But it was it was literally just the fact that there was feedback at all. Like yeah. I hadn't received feedback on my product, and I've just re realized this. It's funny. I I was um, I was recording a my own podcast, and and one of the lessons, uh, basically the the episode was about Ted Lasso, and lessons we can learn from Ted Lasso as a leader. And and I genuinely think there's like so much we can <laughs> glean from it, no matter even though it's like a comedic drama. But one of the uh, scenes in the show is like the clubhouse assistant in Ted Lasso basically delivers this roast to the players where he roasts every player on basically why they stuck at soccer and how they can get better. And it, to me, it was just such a great lesson in direct feedback Yeah, is like the best type of feedback. And we are just so allergic to it in life. And even like I saw this back when I was at Michigan, but even in business every day, I see how people are meeting one-on-one -on -one and they they freeze up when they have to deliver anything other than what's incredibly positive to a person. And so that's what I remember from this conversation is like Austin was super respectful about giving feedback, but he was not afraid about telling me how things could be better. He had this kind of long-term view of understanding, okay, Alex actually wants us to be better. I'm going to tell him how it can be better versus most people will just say this thing is great because they're afraid of any form of confrontation. Yep. It's a sign of a leader being able to give feedback. All right, so you guys are 250 or readers. You're you're printing yep. a PDF or you're posting a PDF. There's nowhere to sign up. What was the kind of transformation to actually making it a newsletter that people could sign up on? And then can you give some context to what the newsletter kind of space looked like in 2015? Yeah, totally. So first of all, when we started a newsletter, it wasn't because we saw other companies doing it or because we thought newsletters were the best way to build a media business, right? Like, I think in retrospect, we look like geniuses, but we were not oracles at all. Like we were, we were basically just like, okay, we want to make business news better. Um, there's only, there's a finite number of ways that we can do it, right? We can put content out on a website or a blog. We can do it through newsletters. We can do it through an app. We didn't even consider a podcast at the time or video because Austin and I had never done any form of like video content. And we were just like, college students use their email a lot. They subscribe to something. They opt into it. Once they've opted in, they've basically given you permission to send something to them. So it's like a really intimate relationship. It's a permission-based relationship. And it's cheap. And like Austin and I were self-funding this at the time. Um, and to get our MailChimp account, I think we paid like $99 a month. That was the only cost of the business because all of our legal documentation um, when we started Morning Brew in March of 2015, was done by the legal center at the University of Michigan Law School. It was a bunch of law students that were advised by a law teacher who was a practicing lawyer, yeah. and it was pro bono, so we didn't pay for any of that. In retrospect, we probably should have just hired a lawyer <laughs> because there were some issues with the paperwork. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, that's why we picked a newsletter. The only newsletter we knew about at the time, like in the very beginning, was the skim. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first, you know, let's call it, four to five years of the business, 
that was the analogy that was always used when I would describe morning brew. It would be like, oh, so you're like the skim for business. And, um, you know, I, like I, I, for the longest time, I thought that was a compliment. Um, because I was like, yeah, they're crushing it. Yeah. We we're like the skim for business. If that, if that's the mental model that works, um, Austin and I officially came out with morning brew, the email newsletter in March of 2015. And basically the way that we converted from that PDF to the newsletter was we put our heads together. We went into the basement of one of the freshman dorms at Michigan called East Quad for several hours. And we just whiteboarded out exactly what we wanted our newsletter to look like, how we wanted it to read, every section we wanted. And the crazy thing is, is like, it hasn't changed all that much. Like, I mean, the content is so much better because we have a great editorial team. But I would say like 80% of it is the same uh, in terms of like the actual structure. And we ended up hiring um, a designer who was a double major between the business school at Michigan and the art school. Remember Arlene? And she, we gave her inspiration for the Morning Brew logo. She drew up the first logo. And it's so, in- you know, another lesson we learned. She drew up the, fir- the logo and we loved it. Uh, in retrospect, it, it was not the best logo to have. It, so it was a, um, it was basically a mug with a suit and tie on it. And, you know, as we started getting more readers and getting big enough, we started getting a, a fair bit of feedback about how we had a gendered logo. And we ended up uh, changing the logo to to not have uh, the, the suit and tie, you know, like Morning Brew's logo today has kind of like the stock ticker. Um, but that was just another learning, I think, in just like having awareness outside of ourselves. Like, we, we were not aware of this because we didn't realize like the the message it was giving off or that, you know, that people would associate it one way, but it makes so much sense. And to be totally honest with you, like it, it just speaks to, unfortunately, how gendered financial services and business have traditionally been. Because as we went through the, like, the exercise of changing our logo a, a few months later from the mug with the suit and tie to something else, you start thinking about like what symbols in business, what symbols you associate with business, briefcase associated with a man typically. Like you, you start going through these things, you're like, shit, they're like most of the things that I think about in business are gendered. Um, so anyway, that's we worked with Arlene, got the branding together, got our newsletter out, and March 15th of um 2015 is when we sent out the first newsletter through MailChimp, where like email was the actual experience. I love it. And would y'all just wake up every morning? Or ha- what was the process for putting in that day's thing? You would just skim all the newspapers, find, agree on kind of five articles, and then the other, the stock tip, the activists of the day, and then just post yeah. it? Or uh, how, what so, was the process? So how how it started was Austin and I every day would go into the Tazi Center at Michigan, which was like, it was basically the uh, the trading floor. Uh, the, the, the business world of Michigan had like this trading floor with all the tickers up, a bunch of TVs. Uh, you know, three, com- three monitor stations. We'd go in there. We'd basically read the internet for a few hours. So all of the primary news sources, we would agree on what we, what stories we thought were most important. And then Austin and I would divide up stories to write, and they'd be somewhere between 150 and 350 words. And we kind of, um, had our lanes that we played in. Like I generally, I think cover like the banking and financial sector where Austin covered tech more. But then what ended up happening was like Austin and I basically said, we are not, we know what we want the voice of Morning Brew to be. And we, we are always super intentional about what that voice is. We would paint a picture of this very specific person, not a real person, but we would walk through like, what are their habits? What do they do on the weekend? What do they read? What do they drink, et cetera? And we were like, we're not, we're not accomplishing that voice. We're not good enough writers to do that. So then what we ended up doing is we were like, Okay, we need to outsource some of this writing. And so we ended up reading out, reaching out to our readers who were mostly college students at the time. We said, Hey, if you want to write about business and get in front of thousands of other students, hit us up. And so we ended up getting probably six to eight college students from different schools, mostly in the Big Ten, because that's like how things spread off of Michigan's campus. Um, they started writing the newsletter, they were managed by like a managing editor who was another student at Michigan, this guy, Michael, um, who wrote for the Michigan newspaper, but also was in the business school. We had found him. He basically managed the schedule of these college students. 
he would do the edit, like the fact checking and the grammatical edit on their content. And then there was one last layer, right? So we had the selection of story process, the writing of story process, the editing of story process. The last thing was the voice. We didn't have anyone to like get the right voice. And so we literally went and had to find a voice editor on Morning Brews cam- uh, or on uh, Michigan's campus. And so we found this guy, Grant, who was in the business program at Michigan, but he also was in the improv troupe at Michigan. So like we, it was this guy who was a unicorn, basically super quick witted uh, and clever, but also knew about business. And so we hired or we brought Grant on as a voice editor couldn't pay him. He was given, you know, some equity in the in the early days. And he would literally edit all of the stories for voice. And um, you know, to this day in my email, I still have his original voice exercise that he applied to uh, Morning Brew with. And I'll I'll, you know, I'll never get rid of that. I love it. Uh I'm gonna ask you a question later on about how you actually find those people today, but we'll we'll save it for a second. So Yeah, the the short answer is it's impo- it's not easy and yeah. there's not a perfect science, but yeah, we'll talk through it. Um all right, so you started at your senior year. Austin was a sophomore. Uh, obviously, like the end of the year comes and now it's time to get a job or not. Where did you kind of end the year and maybe even before the year end, when did you kind of say, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah, so going into senior year, one of the reasons that I have the time to write this market corner that turned into something yeah. is because I already had a job to work at Morgan Stanley for after I graduated from Michigan. And just to paint a picture, that was my dream job. Like my whole life growing up, being a trader, a mortgage-backed security trader was my dream job. <laughs> um, my dad traded mortgages for Citigroup for 20 years. Uh, my mom was on the sales and trading desk at Nomura. Uh, she ran the sale, the repo sales desk. And my grandpa ran fixed income at Prudential. So like, yeah. <laughs> like the most <laughs> ridiculous thing, like fixed income was in my blood, yeah. which is like the most embarrassing thing to say. <laughs> and, and so I, I was in my senior year and I, the, the short answer is I did not renege on my job offer to join Morgan Stanley. Graduated from Michigan, probably had, I want to say 10,000 subscribers at this, that point, moved to New York start working at Morgan Stanley on the agency mortgage trading desk, doing Morning Brew on the side. At that point in time, I wasn't allowed to write it anymore for compliance reasons. Morgan Stanley did not let me write the newsletter or touch the editorial because they were worried that I was going to do insider trading through our newsletter. Um, And so that's why we had to have the system in place for these college students to be able to do it. Um, I worked at Morgan Stanley from... August of 2015 to September of 2016. Austin was still a student. Um, and basically, while I was at Morgan Stanley, it was a, I'd say it was, it was like a emotionally difficult time for me for a few reasons. One is because I wasn't liking my job in trading as much as I kind of like played in my head this, this fantasy of like, I'm going to be the best trader in the world. I'm going to love this. I did not love it. Uh, I also really did not enjoy my first boss. Um, they were not a good mentor or teacher at all. Um, and at the same time, you know, I was just working a shit ton. Like I would wake up, picture this, like I'm, I'm in my first apartment in New York City, five bedroom apartment uh, with four of my roommates from Michigan. Not a true five bedroom. It's a true two bedroom, <laughs> meaning three of the bedrooms were on the interior of the building, no window. Yeah. I was in one of those rooms because my overprotective mom told me if I had one of the bedroom, the the windowed bedrooms, that a burglar would climb up the fire escape, which the window faced, <laughs> and would mug me in my sleep. <laughs> so I had this windowless bedroom. I would get up at five uh, fifteen every morning to go work out at Morgan Stanley. Would get to the trading desk at six thirty. Would work from 6.30 to 7.30 at night. Would get home, call like around 8 o'clock and would spend the rest of the day on morning brew. So I was definitely burnt out. I also had these really mixed feelings where I was like, this is strange. I'm loving what I'm spending my time doing between 8 o'clock and 11.30, way more than what I'm doing during the day. And um, and so ultimately, you know, it was call it eight months of every day leaving work, calling my mom, being like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to make a decision between Morning Brew and Morgan Stanley at some point. 
And September of 2016, I left my job. And, and what preceded that was a few things. One was Austin coming to New York. And Austin was grad. Remember, he's two years younger than me. So he was graduating in 2017. In late 2016, he had to make the decision of if he was going to return to his a place where he had his internship in investment banking and he received a full-time offer. He had to make that decision. We met up in New York City um, at a, a bar, like an old bar on Irving Place. And him and I basically decided that we were going to go full-time on this thing together, meaning I was going to leave my job at Morgan Stanley. He was not going to go into investment banking. And, you know, I, I would say this, like, sure, I took a risk leaving my job in finance. Uh, I would say he took an even bigger risk, meaning he didn't even go to a job and he probably would have made 150K in his first year in banking and he turned that down. Um, but then the other part of this is like how I thought about making the decision to go full-time. And basically there was a few ways I thought about it. I make it sound very obvious and clean today, but it was not this clean. Like it was a lot of me like soul searching for eight months. One thing was like, what's the worst case scenario? I, I constantly ask myself that. And basically I said, the worst case scenario is I go, I leave Morgan Stanley, I work on Morning Brew full time and it fails in the next six months. And if it fails, then what? And I basically went through all these layers of then what? I said, you know, then potentially I've picked up a new toolkit where assuming I haven't burned every bridge at Morgan Stanley, I go back and I have some interesting new skills to be able to be a better trader. Maybe my ability to measure risk is better because I ran a business. I was like, okay, but let's say I'm wrong and I burned every bridge. Then maybe I can go start another business or join another startup because I've built a network in the New York City startup scene. I was like, okay, so let's say I'm wrong about that. Uh, maybe it's a good business school story to go back to business school, started a business, go to business school, makes sense. I was like, okay, let's say I'm wrong about that. And every business school application is someone who started a company. I basically got four layers deep in kind of these then what scenarios. And by the end of it, I was like, if I don't have any of these options open, it really isn't because like Morning Brew failed. It's because I didn't keep my options open. I wasn't well networked. I didn't build relationships over this time. It has nothing to do with the actual business and more how I use my time. And so that made the decision partly clear for me. Then I said to myself, what would I regret more? Would I more regret staying at Morgan Stanley and watching someone else potentially build a next generation uh, millennial focused business media brand? Or would I more regret leaving Morgan Stanley, uh, Morning Brew fails, and I can't go back to work at Morgan Stanley? And the answer to me was super obvious there. I would way more regret seeing someone else build our business. And then the third thing that I thought about, and probably the thing I thought most about was, to be totally honest with you, working in mortgages went from being like peak for me to actually being like terrifying because, you know, because my, my dad passed away my junior year of college uh, instantly. No, no sign of it. He was 48, had a stroke, perfect health. And I was like, this feels like Groundhog Day. Like I'm, I'm in the job that he had for the last 20 years. I'm doing the exact same thing. There was no sign. I'm, there's going to be no sign when I just instantly drop dead. And that scares the shit out of me. It also just like that experience really did, as cliche as it sounds, like solidify for me that like, I really need to spend st time on stuff that gives me joy and energy. Um, be because like life is too short to do stuff where you really don't feel truly happy. And I, I always create a distinction here where it's like, doesn't mean you have to be super passionate or super happy at all times because I don't think that's a realistic reference in life. But generally, most of your time directionally, are you spending time on something that fills you with energy? And the answer at the time was definitely not. So that's kind of how I made the decision to leave. And we have so much in common. I know we've talked about this. I had a father that passed instantly as well and uh, made a lot of decisions kind of based on that. So I feel you there and we don't have to get into it, but I, I feel what you're, what you're saying there. Um, you graduated and you had 10,000 by the next year. What did you have? What was the business like when you decided to leave? And then how could, were you making money at that point? Did you have to raise money? Like you make the decision, yeah. what, where's the business now when you decide to leave Morgan Stanley? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is no, we weren't making money 
and it was way smaller than I thought it was going to be uh, when I left. Like I had promised myself, hey, Alex, if we get to 100,000 subscribers, that's when you have permission to leave. I think I ended up leaving when we had 30,000 or 40,000 subscribers. I think partly it's because like that subscriber number was always a moving target. And I didn't actually know how much, like I didn't know truly how big you had to be to be able to monetize a, a newsletter. But then also we got to this fork in the road where Austin had to make a decision for work, which kind of led me to also having to make a decision. So um, left Morgan Stanley when we had 30,000 to 40,000 subscribers. Um, we were not making money. That obviously was like the big first thing we had to think about because we basically said to ourselves, we are going to take Morning Group from being a newsletter as a hobby, which was called like chapter one of the business to chapter two, which is newsletter as a business. How do we make Morning Brew a newsletter business? And our view is like, it's three steps. Create great content, get the right all eyeballs in front of that content and monetize that audience. And, and so the number one thing was, how are we going to create great content? Well, we can't do it with part-time college students. We have to have full-time staff. Well, we're not making money. How do we hire full-time staff? And that's when we basically said we have to go and raise money. We had never raised money before. Um, we had no idea how to do it. Um, we ended up raising $750,000, which by uh, today's standards was basically nothing. Uh, but we raised $750,000 from 28 individual investors writing individual checks. And that's uh, that's the only money we ever raised for the company. All right, so you raised 750K. Uh, then what did y'all do? Basically, the first uh, thing that we used the money for was to hire talent. Um, we needed to hire people to create great content for this newsletter. And so we hired this person uh, from AngelList. Um, they had experience in journalism. They were young. We thought you know they would be hungry, but they had kind of expertise in in business writing. Um, and they ended up quitting after three months. They, they simply couldn't do it anymore. They were getting in every day at 8.30 a.m. They were honestly leaving at like 11.30 p.m. There was absolutely no balance um, in that early of the business, right? Like <laughs> it, there was no, no one to pass the work off to. It was just the newsletter gets created and it's good or it doesn't. And so they ended up leaving led to us hiring another writer. Um, and so basically, we spent most of the uh, money hiring talent. So it was in the beginning, writers. It was our um, first engineer uh, who worked on both our website, our referral program, and growth. Uh, and then we hired uh, a salesperson, like a junior salesperson to join me as well. So it was mo mostly personnel. And by the time we got to call it like the last two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of the seven hundred and fifty, we got into a point where we were monetizing the business enough to actually just sustain paying through cash flow. And monetizing the business was through selling advertisements on the newsletter. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this was very much not a science in the early days for a few reasons. One, advertising on newsletters back you know, in 2017 was not necessarily something that was thought of as a viable business. Other than the skim, there were really no examples of companies that were monetizing via advertising in a successful way. The only analog example is Daily Candy. But Daily Candy, after being acquired for a shit ton of money, ended up not being a, a, a good acquisition. Um, I believe it went to zero. And so... What we basically did is we had to figure out how are we going to story tell Morning Brew's audience to get advertisers to pay to tell their story natively in Morning Brew. And the way we prioritize this is we said, let's find the warmest possible leads. And so we basically said, okay, one, a, a warm lead is going to be an advertiser that already spends in email newsletters. So we if we can find kind of who the chronic email advertisers are. We'll focus our attention there. And then beyond that, let's focus on chronic email advertisers who have readers of Morning Brew. And so we would literally in the early days go through our email list and see who were people that read Morning Brew from these companies um, so that we knew like there's a good chance they already know what Morning Brew is. And that's how we focused our attention 
a lot of our early advertisers were DTC brands that were performance advertisers. So meaning they would spend advertising dollars with the expectation of revenue coming out of that. That's different from call it the other big bucket of advertising, which is called brand advertising. So people who spend on out of home or TV ads, they don't necessarily expect revenue from their advertisements. They expect consumers to have a different perception, a changed perception of their brand. And so our early advertisers were everyone from Allbirds to Casper to Warby. Um, and the reason was they already had experience with email newsletters and they didn't care how well-known of a media brand you were. They just cared about getting user acquisition. And if they could do that with Morning Brew, even though Morning Brew had no name, uh, they would keep spending with us as long as the cost to acquire new customers worked well for them. And basically your ads would, if they clicked on a Casper ad, you could prove to uh, Casper that that sale came from them clicking on an ad that you had. Exactly. And it's not, you know, there's not going to be perfect yeah. attribution uh, because, you know, you'll have people who click on the ad on their, uh, in the beginning of a work day, they'll see Casper there. They don't feel like buying a mattress at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning and they end up going to onto their computer at home and looking up Casper and going there and buying it, you're never going to get that attribution. Yeah. But for the most part, there would be a unique link that people would click on. It would lead to Casper's website, and we would get uh, we would get credit for that. And you talked about a referral program. How did that work? Yeah, so it's so interesting because when we created the the referral program for Morning Brew we felt like we were late to the game. Like we felt like referral programs were already very much a thing. And we were just like kind of joining the bandwagon. Time is an interesting thing because now it's like Morning Brew is constantly credited with like our best in class referral program. And it's been really successful for us. But it's, to me, it was just an interesting learning. And when things feel late to you, if you're super in the weeds, they're probably early. Um, And so what we did was the reason we even thought about a referral program is because the first way we tried to just like grow Morning Brew was on, on Michigan's campus, where Austin and I would go into every class and club on campus. We would do our two-minute spiel where we would explain what Morning Brew was, the outcome that it would drive for people, how it was free so there was no downside, and we would ask people to write down their email addresses on a piece of paper with a pen. And then we'd go and input all those emails in after the class. And then basically step two was like, okay, we've saturated the Michigan market. Let's get the other Alex's and Austin's of all other colleges to do the same thing. That's what led from us doing kind of like guerrilla marketing on campus to introducing an ambassador program. And then we were like, okay, this ambassador program is working pretty well. How do we automate it? And how do we allow anyone to be an ambassador, not just a college student? That's what led to the referral program. And so when we were researching referral programs, uh, we ended up coming across this article, I think it was on Tim Ferriss's blog, about how Harry's Razors had did a really successful launch with their product, where they basically built a landing page. You would put in your email address to be notified of when Harry's Razors came out. And then if you referred people to Harry's Razors, uh, you would either move up the line or you would get uh, certain rewards like a free razor, free uh, shower caddy, et cetera. And so we were like, oh, we, we have to build this. And so we ended up going on Upwork. We found a developer in Ohio, this guy, Connor, and we reached out to him and we we're like, hey, can you just rebuild this whole Harry's Razors landing page? But instead of like the woolly mammoth that was their like logo, just, you know, put us on it. Like, do the Morning Brew logo. And he was like, oh, it's funny you asked for that. Five other people in the last four weeks have asked me to do the same exact thing. And so he ended up for $500 just building our whole new database and website with this landing page. And obviously, it's been improved over the years now that we have our own uh, tech team internally. But like the premise is the same. A like A referral program is nothing more than acting as an accelerant for word of mouth marketing. Our whole thing was our product has to be great. People have to really love it. But then how can we how can we further incentivize people to share the newsletter? Like go from loving the newsletter to telling others that they love the newsletter. 
And we were like, this referral program is perfect. And so basically what it was, was you sign up for Morning Brew, you get a unique referral link. So morningbrew.com slash, and there's uh, a string of numbers and letters. And if you and with any of your friends, family, colleagues share that link, people are taken to the Morning Brew website. It looks the exact same, but on the back end, it says, so, you know, XYZ person was the referrer here. And as you get people to sign up, you earn different rewards. And we were really strategic about the rewards we picked in the sense that we wanted things that were cheap so that the acquisition cost of these referrals wouldn't be too high, but things that someone who makes the choice to refer someone to Morning Brew would really care about. And our view is like, who's the type of person that is a fanboy or fangirl of Morning Brew and goes out of their way to share it? And we're like, someone who really cares about the brand and loves our content. And so that's why over the years, like our rewards have been everything from our Sunday edition of Morning Brew, which was literally just instead of paywalled content, referral walled content. And that when you got to three referrals, you would get uh, our Sunday edition. We had our Facebook group or we have our Facebook group. So a community for Morning Brew's top referrers. And I think there's been a lot of learnings there in terms of like what works for community building versus not. And then swag. And our whole thing around swag was cheap stuff that people can show off in public as a sense of, as a type of, uh, you know, status symbol. And so stickers, you can put them on your computer or your phone, public uh, status flexing, or a mug, which was our logo, and you can put on your desk at work and people can see it as well. And so right now, Morning Brew has just over 3 million subscribers on our daily newsletter and over 300,000 people have gotten at least one referral. And, you know, from what I understand about referral programs, typically brands are hoping for somewhere around like one to 3% of their customers to be um, refers. 300,000 is obviously 10% of 3 million. But when you consider the people who actually open our newsletter, which is just over a million people a day, you're talking about 30 plus percent of our active audience that is deciding to share Morning Brew with someone in their network. Wow. All right. So you, so you, you, you were at 3 million now and you ha- were in an article the other day when you kind of discussed kind of the balloon effect, which es- essentially is a lot of grinding and a lot of working. And then all of a sudden things really start working. And so was there like an inflection point along the way? Obviously, you started making sales uh, and started becoming cash flow positive. But kind of what was was there was there a moment? Was it something, or was it just a lot of grinding that caused the balloon effect to happen? Yeah, and um, you know, just for for listeners, um, you know, this idea of the balloon effect. Actually, the first time I think I thought about it was when I was studying Mr. Beast. Um, who is one of the biggest YouTubers in the world. He has 70 million subscribers. And what I was trying to describe is <clears throat> how Mr. Beast has been creating YouTube content basically since he's, I think, 24 now. He's been creating YouTube content since high school. And he's been basically posting on YouTube consistently for, I want to say, 12 years. And he's only seen like real success in the last three to four years. So he was posting thanklessly for eight years before seeing any sort of success. And I refer to that as like the balloon effect where it's basically, you know, you're filling a water, uh, a balloon with water in your sink. It's continuing to expand, but you have no idea when it's going to pop. And when it pops, it covers way more surface area because it's no longer contained. And you can't predict when it's going to pop. But as long as you keep the faucet open, as in like work really hard, put the right stuff out, it will pop at some point. And so that happened for Mr. Beast. And for us, that happened in... In 2018 to 2019. 2018 to 2019, Morning Brew went from 100,000 subscribers to a million subscribers. And that was a function of this like right grow sell flywheel spinning the right way, where basically we had great content we were putting out into the world. We had the right organic growth strategies. But then because we were selling Morning Brew to advertisers, we had now cash flow to invest into paid advertising. And Morning Brew has always been a very cash flow positive business because if you think about it, a newsletter, it's a constrained piece of content. It's not like a website where you can produce an infinite amount of content. And the downside of that is you have a finite amount of advertising you can put on it. 
The upside is that you only need three writers to put out a newsletter. You will only ever need three writers to put out a newsletter. And so as we gain subscribers, as we tied the number of subscribers to how much we were charging for advertising, the margin just expanded. And so we took that cash flow and we basically invested it either A, into people that plugged into one of these three steps, write, grow, or sell, or we invested into paid acquisition, paid marketing. And we went from spending you know, a couple hundred dollars a week on paid marketing to at the peak, Morning Brew was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every month on paid marketing. And that's what allowed us to grow to basically 10x our audience in a year. And the reason this was such an inflection point is because we also saw that the ceiling for monetizing a newsletter was so much higher than we had ever believed. We thought at some point our audience would keep growing, but the the rate at which we could increase advertising would no longer be linear to our audience growing. You know, we're now in late 2021. And that is still, we still have not hit that ceiling. And so I think that was kind of like the wow moment. We we're like, wow, actually monetizing this single product scales far better than we thought it it would. And it's going to give us enough cash flow to not just invest in this product, but to invest in other things moving forward without raising another cent of capital. And so the, the right grow sell, clearly the content has to be great. When yep. you're selling an ad, maybe even take it today. How is an ad? How do you price an ad right now? Is it the um, is it you sign a contract and based on how many clicks that ad gets is what the uh, customer ends up paying? Do they pay a lump sum up front? Like how do you price so, an ad? Yeah, so it's evolved over time. In the early days, it was literally just a flat fee. So the first ad, um, I'll never forget it. The first ad we ever ran for Morning Brew was for MM Lafleur. It was a um, uh, it was a uh, basically like a college ring, uh, company, um, and, or not MM LaFleur, sorry, M LaHart. Um, it was a college ring company and they bought three ads with us, $900 a piece, $2,700 for the campaign. The reason we got it was because one of our investors worked at, um, a big media agency. They were a client and he literally emailed us being like, uh, got you guys some beer money. That was actually his email saying, uh, how he like, he got us this small ad deal. So in the beginning, it was just, we have a fixed rate. As we're growing, we're going to just step up our fixed rate and we're going to keep stepping it up until we are seeing a number of our clients say the economics are no longer working for them. Then at some point, you know, traditionally how things are talked about in media is CPMs. At some point, we went to a CPM model, but then we quickly moved to a CPV model, which was not a real thing. We just came up with it. And what CPM basically means is cost per thousand impressions. So in newsletter terms, that would be cost per thousand subscribers. What we switched to was cost per thousand opens instead of subscribers. And the reason we did that is it allowed us to tell a story that flexed kind of like our biggest asset, which was Morning Brew's open rate. The, the typical industry open rate is 20, a 20% daily unique open rate. Morning Brew still around at 3 million plus subscribers is a 40% daily unique open rate. Um, I don't know any other daily newsletters that are close to that. And so CPV allowed us to basically say, hey, all these, all these different companies, these products, these newsletters are charging you for all their subscribers, but it's bullshit because those people don't even have a chance to read the newsletter. We'll charge you just for the people who open, who had a chance to see your advertisement. And so we charged on a CPV for a while. And now, as Morning Brew has more assets, where we're not just selling newsletters, but we're selling newsletters, podcasts, social, branded content, like it is a true package, it's a different type of story where where a client from an agency will come to us and they'll say, hey, we're looking to work with Morning Brew to get you know our, um, our new uh, consumer banking platform in front of a upwardly mobile millennial professional audience. We have a $500,000 budget. Let us know what you can do for $500,000. And then we will fill out a spreadsheet that basically says all of the different assets that we'll be able to leverage to tell your brand story. So that's typically how it goes now. Wow. All right. Moving on to some big things that kind of happened over the last year. Yep. Y'all sold. We did. Uh, Congratulations again. 
Thanks, man. That's awesome. Was there, was there a decision internally that it's time to sell? Did you have to raise capital? Did somebody just give you an offer? Kind of how did it begin? And then, and how are y'all valued in the market? Yeah. So <clears throat> basically what happened was Austin and I, you know, throughout 2018 and 2019, we had received some like indication of interest. And we, what we constantly said was, no, we're not interested. We think this has room to go. No, we're not interested. We think this has room to go. Um, and it, it's funny that the, the first time we actually ever received any sort of interest was more to be uh, aqua hired versus acquired. And it was actually by, um, you know, John Steinberg at Cheddar. Uh, he had connected with us very early on when he was about to launch Cheddar. And we said, you know, we're, we're think what you're doing is awesome, but we're interested in doing our own thing. And then we received kind of like interest from different media brands, growth equity investors, et cetera, um, over the years. Gets to, I want to say, December of 2019. And basically one of our close contracts, uh, contacts at Insider was like, hey, um, Insider and Axel Springer are really looking to expand within the US. Would you be open to having a conversation? And, you know, one thing that I've always said to myself is I will always have a conversation. Doesn't mean it's going to go somewhere, but they're like, why close off options? So I had a conversation. And then basically, you know, out of that conversation, Austin and I had a discussion and we were like, we, we were like, we still really don't want to sell, but there's some price at which we have to entertain the conversation. And so we basically emailed them back saying, hey, you know, we, we think we're going to hold off for a little while. We don't feel like it's the right time. Um, it, uh, unless there was some, you know, basically not stupid price, but some crazy price. Um, and they were basically like, well, let's talk about that price. So we ended up having a conversation and, and with insider and just for context, this insider relationship, you know, it started a year and a half or two years prior when Claudius, who was at the time came from Axel Springer. He was working for Axel Springer. Axel Springer is who owns Business Insider or, you know, Insi Business Insider is branded as Insider today. He had come from Axel Springer to run the consumer subscription um, business for Business Insider. So Business Insider's paid subscription, Prime, he came to run that business. And then he had moved from that position to chief of staff to Henry Blodgett, the CEO. And then uh, before leaving Insider, he was COO. We had been introduced to him and I was actually introduced to him because in the early days of Morning Brew, I had been reaching out to one of the editors at Business Insider to try and syndicate our newsletter on their website. Again, I was just scratching and clawing, trying to find any way to grow our audience. And at some point, this editor was just annoyed by me. He was like, this kid has to stop. He's like peppered me 10 times. So he foisted me on Claudius and got introduced to Claudius. Claudius um, and I met on Stone Street in Manhattan because... Our WeWork space was in the financial district. Insider's office is in the financial district. So we met up. We talked about just media. He talked about the you know history of Axel Springer. And we just kept this ongoing relationship. We would play ping pong from time to time in our different offices. And, um, and so fast forward now to early 2020, we started having these conversations about potentially doing something, potentially doing a deal. And it looks really interesting. And then COVID happens. And basically, you know, from March of 2020 to let's call it May of 2020, the conversation just dies, partly because everyone's trying to figure out what's going on in the world, partly because like we are advertisers, we're just like hemorrhaging money at this point from advertisers backing out on their ad deal saying we can't spend with you guys. Like within a few weeks, you know, we lost a few dozen advertisers. And then things picked back up in, let's call it June of 2020, and the deal was done in October of 2020. And ultimately, you know, we didn't do this deal because we needed cash for the business. We did the deal for, for two reasons. One is because we had really big ambitions for Morning Brew to be the media brand for our generation, not just a newsletter company. Business Insider had started similarly when Henry started the company, um, you know, 14 years ago now. Um, where he, it started as a newsletter. Now, Business Insider is a full media brand, uh, you know, with almost a thousand employees doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And 
we we thought there's an opportunity to learn how to basically scale from the stage we were at to full media brand from a proven entrepreneur who had done that. And that was really exciting to us. And also to work with a partner who strategically could help us grow. That was really exciting. And then the second thing um, is just more from a personal perspective, right? Like it was a life-changing amount of money. Um, something that I, I kept saying to myself, you know, to have this privilege, this opportunity at age, tw- at the time, 27, um, the just the the amount of options that it creates um and to me that what it really creates is you know money creates time time is the most precious thing it it was too much to say no um but obviously there was also all the benefit that i had just talked about um and for me it was you know austin and i while both of us were like this is life changing i think it also is it served different purposes for us for me, it was like, you know, going back to what I had mentioned about my dad, you know, when he was on the hospital bed after having a stroke. And, you know, at that point, we basically knew that was it. Um, I, I basically said to him, you know, I'm going to take care of everyone. And it's such a, you know, <laughs> I, I, um, I kind of like, reflect on that. And it's interesting why, like why I chose to say that or why I assume that responsibility. Because if I'm being honest with myself, I, I'm, I'm really lucky, lucky to come from a place of privilege where I didn't have to create that responsibility, but I did anyway. Um, I created that. And, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's just an interesting thing that I chose to do that. And so everything from that point on, building Morning Brew, a key part of that, not only having a, lo- it wasn't just having a love for the game, having a love for entrepreneurship, trying to build a huge media brand for our generation. There was also this big component, which was like taking care of my family because the Lieberman household was now cash flow out, no cash flow in. Because at, at that point, my mom had already retired from Wall Street. And you know, without my dad making money anymore, all I could visualize was cash out. And so um, the, the deal also for me kind of like brought that full circle where I felt like no matter what happens within kind of like my family now, everyone will be okay. Yeah. That's incredible, man. At 27, you would have had to trade a lot of mortgages to be in the same situation <laughs> by 27. Yeah. And uh, to be, if I'm being totally honest with you, I was a pretty shitty mortgage trader. So what, I don't even know if it would, would have been possible. <laughs> Is there anything cool that you did when it, when it transacted in that vein? Well, th- I mean, that's, that's, that's the really interesting thing, right? Is, um, is uh, like, uh, you know, I remember the day, obviously, that the, you know, the transaction closed, that the wires hit the bank accounts. I remember being, you know, kind of like on a Zoom um, with, uh, with all the different people at BI, with Austin, uh, with folks at Axel Springer. And then I remember my mom, my grandpa, my grandma, my girlfriend were over. They had brought like balloons and champagne. And it's like, I think they were more excited or more ecstatic in that moment than I was. And this is not to say that like I wasn't happy. I was happy, but it was, it was kind of anticlimactic. Like, I don't know if it's because like my natural way is to like kind of push back emotions or to like normalize everything to keep a level head because that's what, what's kind of allowed me to like both survive trauma and entrepreneurship. But I was like, I was excited, but the things that made me happiest and it's like the cliche thing to say, but I, I truly experienced that for the first time is it, it really isn't the destination. It's the journey that, that makes you happiest. Um, and in terms of, you know, what I've done with it, <laughs> like I am, uh, I'm as frugal today as I've ever been. Like I, we, we got a dog after the transaction, but I still would have gotten a dog. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest with you, it's like, I, I need to, kind of teach myself how to spend more. Like I actually think uh, deprivation of cash can be as harming as spending of cash because, you know, one of the reasons you make money is to enjoy your experiences with the people you care a lot about in life. Like I think I really need to kind of grow into that. But also I realized like that behavior, and by the way, Austin and I are very similar in that regard. That behavior actually did us a disservice in business at times because we were so frugal, because we like treated our money like it was the last dollar in business. Yes, it made us very disciplined. 
But also, there are times where we didn't hire nearly fast enough in the early days at, at a fear of spending too much of our money, where I think actually would have created a way better environment for our team because people wouldn't have been, you know, working down to the bone um, and uh, everyone felt would, wouldn't have felt like they were operating at 110% of capacity. Yep. Nope. That's, uh, you hear that story a lot. I mean, it's your first company. I'm sure if you build another one, you'll probably think differently, especially around hiring and how you spend money. But it sounds like it was a good outcome and y'all did the right things along the way. Yeah, it was, um, again, it's, uh, it was a really, um, it was a really cool moment. Um, but it definitely, uh, it made me one appreciate like these different memories along the journey were like the truly special parts of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also just made me again, realize that, um, uh, like the obviously money is important, uh, but there is there is a point, uh, and I I can't remember the study that was done. I think they say it was like seventy five thousand dollars in income. I think it's different for everyone, mm -hmm. but there's a point at which you make beyond it, and it does not change your marginal happiness at yep. all or that much. And you um, actually create more stress. Exactly, and, and you know, um. I, w I would just say that I found that to be a very true thing where um, past that point, it can create stress and also makes you realize that seeking like this, this uh, notion in the back of a lot of people's brain of money will drive happiness or money is the end goal um, ends up, ends up being a fool's errand. Um, and where like you realize the most important things are just like having a sense of self, having really great people that care about you, that you care about around you and sharing experiences with them. Yep. All right. To close out the the transaction uh, conversation, it, and if you can share, uh, maybe at a high level, how, how is a newsletter valued? Is it valued on users? Is it just a multiple of cash flow? Is it all of the above? Yeah. Ge generally, um, it's not by subscriber. Generally, um, let's call it growth stage media businesses are valued as uh, a multiple of revenue, not of uh, EBITDA. Um, and generally the market has been like, the high end has been 3X revenue. Um, the the low end has been, you know, your slower growth, you know, one and a half to 2X. Um, and... I haven't really seen anything outside of that range unless it's a, or a media business that's deriving its cash flows not from advertising, like subscribe, you know, obviously like any sort of diversification, you'll get a plus on the multiple number. Uh, if you have a significant subscription business, you'll get serious plus. Um, and so that, that was kind of the proxy that was used is like recent transactions in media. Um, it was generally thought of on a revenue multiple basis and also based on where, you know, what we thought revenue was going to be on the business in the following year as well. Got it. All right. The The second thing that we uh, share in common, well, maybe not the second, it's, we have very uh, a lot in common, but you uh, decided this year after being the CEO of Morning Brew for, call it six, seven years, to make a transition. Um, I did the same into a more founder chairman role. Um, what was kind of the spark that led to that and kind of how has it played out? It's now been a few months. Yeah. So the short answer is what led to that is in a lot of ways, my co-founder was already doing the job yep. of what I would say, like the next stage of our business CEO required. And, and what I mean by that is like in the early days, I would say the job of the CEO was very much to will a product into existence, will a product into acceptance, and will a product into actually being a business. Um, once we got to a certain point, it was the product existed, it was good enough, the market accepted it, and advertisers accepted it. It was now, I would say, more of an operational CEO's role. It was, um, how do we scale the business? Um, how do we manage our senior leadership team? How do we get all our whole company rowing in the same direction long term for the next six months, 12 months, 18 months? 
And what I ended up, you know, kind of realizing, I, I think what I, what I didn't r- truly appreciate was like, we had hit that stage of like kind of operational CEO. And Austin, who was the COO for the longest time, was doing the job of the operational CEO. And I was kind of just spending my time on the stuff that I enjoyed spending my time on that I didn't, that I'd spent my time on in the early days, which was like building a new shit. So like spending time with like the new newsletters in our business or the podcast we had launched or our educational product, Morning Brew Accelerator that we launched. Like that's where I was spending my time or like creating my own podcast, Founders Journal. And so in a lot of ways, it was just a changing of the titles to match how we were already spending our time. It's been, I think, four or five months since the change. And the way I would describe it is, I think it was actually very hard for me in the beginning. Um, I think it was very hard for me because one, my identity had become so tied with being the CEO of Morning Brew for five years. When I moved out of the role, it was like a piece of my identity had gone away. What am I going to fill this void with? Um, the second was, I think there was a feeling of guilt um, or shame. Uh, I, I said to myself, is this happening because I didn't do a good enough job? Is this happening because I didn't scale with the company fast enough? If I had, would it look more like a Bezos or Elon-esque trajectory where the CEO grows with the company every step of the way from building CEO to operational CEO and then even beyond that. And I would say I'm generally in a place where I (coughs) I think I've worked through these feelings and where I kind of net out is that um, rather rather than feel kind of like a shame or a guilt, Actually, one, be super appreciative that there's stuff that I know I like doing more and and own that rather than saying, why can't I like that more? Where why can't I be why can't that be kind of like my superpower? Like I would say my superpower is thinking creatively about a solution that doesn't exist and willing it into existence and being the best storyteller of that solution. Like period, end of story. Um And so I think, one, I had to kind of like be okay with the fact that like at least right now at this point in my life, my interest, I don't have enough interest in kind of the uh, the responsibilities of an operational CEO to do the job really well. And I think that was something that became really hard for me to get to because I constantly was like, am I not good enough? Am I not good enough? Am Am I not good enough? And the second part was becoming like super appreciative that I had a co-founder who honestly, so luckily, this is his shit. Like that, this is what he loves doing. This is the type of brain that he has. And I've talked to a lot of, you know, founders who were CEOs and moved into executive chairman roles where they didn't have that good fortune and they had to go out into the market and basically replace themselves. Whereas I was so lucky to have a partner who could just be slotted into the role. And that is such a lower friction way than things typically have to be done. But you know, the short answer is I'm incredibly grateful, actually, that this move has given me time uh, to to kind of work on the things before that I said, like, are the stuff that I've really kind of found to matter, like better understanding myself, getting a deeper sense of self, et cetera. Um, but also being a, in a position where um, I can still add value to the business in different ways from the content I create to the connections that I make to being kind of like a sparring partner for my co-founder, which in a lot of ways are the things I actually enjoy doing. But it just took me a while to truly accept that because to accept that made it originally made me feel like I had to kind of accept defeat of not loving and being good at everything. Yep. Man, you said that uh, better than I could have, but uh, this isn't about me. It's about you. But the description that you gave of a title change, not really a role change, um, you know, same thing for me. Uh, that's what I've told everybody. Uh, my partner who was COO at the time became CEO. He was already doing the things. 
Um, I was burnt out of trying to convince myself that <clears throat> I loved operations and I loved this new part of the business. Uh, I had a lot of fear and doubt and uh, ultimately it's it's the best decision. And I think we're built a lot of the same way as it gives me a lot more time to focus on what I love doing, which I'm very fortunate at 34 to be able to do. Um, but it is almost identical kind of the the thought process. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, of course. And, you know, uh, I appreciate you bringing it up. And it's honestly, sometimes I feel like even bad talking about it, right? Because it's like such a not a problem problem in the sense that like, you know, I'm talking about moving from CEO to executive chairman. Like this is not a real problem in the, in like the, the, in just like the whole context of, of life. But nevertheless, the way that I've thought about it is like, there's no right or wrong problem or or bigger or smaller problem per se. It's like, it's the, the emotional response that people have to problems. Um, you know, what, once you're past the point of being able to truly like um, provide for your own living. And I would say this has just been a, a problem uh, for me in the sense that there's been a, a large emotional reaction to going through it. Um, it sounds like, you know, we, we've been kind of similar in that regard. Yeah. And I would just kind of cap it off by just saying it's a very selfless uh, move. You put the business first and what was best for the business and not your own priorities or agenda first and Morning Brew will be better for it. And um, ultimately, that'll be a good thing for you. Yeah, totally. And I think, uh, you know, the big thing now is is with there's the part of me that's uh that's de- continuing to dedicate myself to the brew uh like i said where it's being a, a creator uh with my podcast video franchise on youtube etc cetera, etc cetera. being a cheerleader for the business whether that's conferences tv appearances etc and just like helping to be a kind of creative partner to my co-founder but there's also just kind of this new question of like, with some of this time that's been opened up, um, what do I do? And, <laughs> and I, I don't know the answer to, to that question. Maybe all I should do is spend time to spend time playing golf so I can actually beat you in golf. But other than that, <laughs> I don't know the answer yet. And we are going to get that on the calendar. Uh, <laughs> all right. You've been very generous. I got a couple more questions and then a few personal and then we'll we'll bring it home. Cool. But you've sold. Uh you're now uh, under the insider umbrella. Is the goal going forward to go from 3 million to 10 million users or is the goal to offer you know those 3 million users a lot more products and ways in which they can uh, interact with the business or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And the way I would answer it is kind of the non-answer answer. It depends. Um, if you're talking about our B2B business, so Morning Brew basically has two businesses, B2B and B2C. B2C helps you just um, be a more well-rounded, more informed business professional. B2B is the content in our org that helps you make better decisions in your specific job, function, or industry. Within B2B, the goal is, to, to use your exact analogy, not to go from 3 million to 10 million, it's to go from 3 million to 4 million and squeeze as much juice out of the 4 million as possible. With the B2C org, where we've really transitioned from just doing newsletter to newsletter, web, social, audio, video, it is very much a goal of going from 3 million to 10 million. Yep. All right. I know this is uh, this could be a loaded question. We don't have to make it a huge answer, but... Um, I, you know, I follow you and by the way, your podcast is phenomenal. If anybody has Thank not you, listened to it. Founders Journal, uh, you have to. You've dove into kind of crypto blockchain, uh, you know, through threads that you've written. It's clear that you're studying it. And the question is, how does crypto and blockchain impact Morning Brew? And I'll give it a little more context. It seems to me like the world is starting to reorganize itself online into kind of these smaller communities that can be trusted. Yeah. The trust in big corporate media giants and institutions is kind of dropping daily. So like, do you think about crypto and blockchain impacting your business? Um, and and is there a way that Morning Brew participates in it? Yeah, so is there a way we participate in it? 
Absolutely. I think both from a content perspective, participating in the conversation around it, but also from a product perspective, uh, I think there is a place for us to play um, specifically in the world of NFTs and Morning Brew having or minting uh, an NFT pro- uh, project. Um, the reason I've been so interested in it is honestly because I think it is the most direct connection of community content and commerce that can exist. There is this cons like there's been this constant push of community content and commerce to be intertwined, right? So what I mean by that is back in the day when like, you know, pre-internet, you have a TV show, there is so much friction for say like a daytime TV host to sell a product that is a product created by the TV network that the host is on, given that, say, the the person on TV pitched the product, you'd have to go get out your computer, you'd have to go to the website, how would there even be attribution? Like, it, the, the linkage, there was so much friction. Whereas, like, then what happened with, I would say, just, like, social attribution and, like, media getting to a certain point, there's so much less friction to turn content brands into communities and also into commerce companies, meaning having a product that you sell to your audience. Why has that become big? Well, one, in the age of Facebook and Instagram, where it's basically pay to play and it costs more than ever to build an audience, if you're a media brand that has a trusted audience that you've acquired and you own now, it creates an incredible incredible leverage where you have an owned marketing channel and you have the advantage of not having to pay to acquire customers to pay for a product. And so, you know, the example I'd use is like Food 52. Food 52 is like a food media brand. Uh, They were invested in by Churnin. Churnin is also who invested in uh, Barstool and a number of other media brands. Um, Most recently, Zen Run, Zed Run, which is the um, the uh, blockchain based horse racing, digital horse racing game. But Food 52 has recipes. They have uh, like uh, drink recipes, etc. It's a website around food content. But then, of course, they have a shop on their website. And their shop has curated cookware from other companies, but they also introduced their own brand called 52 that they sell through their website. Now, if I'm reading a recipe on Food 52's website, the ease with which I can go from looking at a soup recipe on their website to clicking on shop, going to one of their 52 pans and buying it is frictionless. Um, What I think like NFTs and the world of uh, kind of Web3 does is it makes that connection even clearer where now it's like I buy, I'll just use the example of what um, what Chris Cantino um, and Jamie Schmidt are doing. They they created a community uh, called uh, Crypto Package Goods, you know, play on consumer package goods. They minted an NFT project you buy one of their NFT tokens, you get an invite to their community to be a part of that of their community through Telegram. Um, what Web3 effectively does is it's going to just allow community, commerce, and content to all exist at once. And so I'm just fascinated as someone who's like a content junkie and a media junkie. I think there's just going to be huge media companies built on blockchain and what I even mean by that is, you know, I had this kind of kind of ridiculous, but not, I, I don't think entirely ridiculous idea the other day of like, what does the new Disney look like, right? Like when Walt Disney was uh, writing out his whole it, um, vision for Disney, right? You, you know, you've seen this kind of like often, like it goes around the internet, this picture of a web and the web shows like IP that's created ar- around like these different characters that ends up fueling the amusement park, which ends up fueling uh, merchandise, which ends up fueling uh, like their TV shows or movies. Like it all fuels itself. It, and I think there's going to be this world where imagine like if Goofy wasn't just owned by one company, but instead it was it was decentralized and, and owned by um, someone in the community. And what I mean by that is Imagine like a a crypto, an NFT project is like Disney World, where it 
creates all these characters. So let's say it creates Goofy and Minnie and Mickey and Donald Duck. But versus being like Disney, where the project just owns all these characters, say those characters are actually bought by individuals. And the project just gives the tools to the individuals to build their own media brands and assets out of them. So say like I buy the the Donald Duck NFT or token. So I own the actual rights, the usage rights to that character. And I'm given the tools by this project for how to create a newsletter around Donald Duck or how to create TikTok videos around Donald Duck or a partner to create uh, a line of collectible toys around Donald Duck. And so what if you end up putting like the tools in the hands of all of your community to create brands around every single character? I think there's the ability to actually create larger brands that have ever been created before because it's not now created by just one internal company, but actually everyone in the community has the tools to create brands around these individual characters that are part of a larger umbrella. So it's almost in a lot of ways like open sourcing or outsourcing a media company. Golly. The next the next 10 years are going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And and what I will say, by the way, is as I say this, I understand basically like 60% of what's happening in NFTs and, and Web3. And that's kind of why I'm intrigued by it. Because I feel like the learning curve is so street, uh, so steep. I feel like everyone's learning as we go. Like the, the plane is being assembled midair. Um, I feel like there's a huge suck of intelligence and talent into this world. So being surrounded by them, I'm just excited by the osmosis of learning from them. And also part of it, I part of what I enjoy is this puzzle of knowing that like 96% of what's happening in, and that's a, such a random number, uh, some high percentage of what's happening in crypto is kind of bullshit or it's opportunistic ways for people to make money. But there's some sliver that is here that is going to lay a foundation for really special things to happen over the next five to 10 years. Yep. Yeah, you got to get through the messy part, see all the failures and then the 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 uh you know the golden nuggets continue to shine through it all um, exactly but there's going to be yeah some downside okay one more question then i'm gonna let you go kind of back to what i was saying the, you know we've just gone through covid which is crazy um you know you see big there's you know there's all these media giants and everybody has their own information and it's hard to know what to trust and you see companies like New York Times often, you know, redacting things that they yep. published even that morning. In your head or in your mind and you're in the media business, is there, do we just get through this or is there some hope that we kind of get back to like a single source of truth or are we just living in a world now where everybody has an opinion and you just need to learn how to, you know, figure out what's truth to you? Uh, well, no, I don't think we go back to a single source of truth. Um, I just think kind of like the cat's out of the bag and because the the way the internet has been built and the way the tools have been created, the cost of creating content is, has never been lower and the incentives to create content have never been higher because there's a ton of power that comes along with building and owning an audience. Um, I think it becomes more and more fragmented, not less. And by the way, this is one of the reasons that I think curation, like uh, Morning Brews, like one of our whole parts of our, our ethos was being great at curating the most important things in business. Like, I just think it keeps getting more important because it's like, as there is more and more content on the internet, as it becomes harder and harder to sift through and understand what is true, what is real. More and more is there the need, and as people have less time and more things competing for their attention than ever before, more and more is there a need for finding not necessarily like the source that you trust, but like the person that you trust to tell you the sources that you should trust. And this is why I think like why there's so much power in like the individual is not just because the tools have been democratized to create great content, whether you're an individual or a brand. But I think people look to other people to tell them what is right versus wrong or fact versus fiction more than they look at a brand to do that. And, and so that's why I think like curation is only going to get more important. And also why I think like 
there it's not it, there's going to be this he, the the long tail is going to keep getting bigger because people are going to look to the the person who they feel like most identifies with their beliefs or their interests but that is such a, like a custom and personal thing that it, I, I don't think it's going to be like any one person has so much power there will be an incredibly long tail and i'm sure that is you know one of the principles of why substack thinks they're going to be a billion dollar company right I love it. And you, uh, you obviously have a lot of experience in this and, uh, I resonate with that. Um, but I do want to get to a world where it's easy to kind of, you know, at least understand what's going on. Um, I, I think a lot yeah, of people do. I, I to I totally agree. I think, um, the issue here is that, um, the business, none of the business models, I think support fact-based news. Like that's at the end of the day, businesses go where money goes, audiences go where businesses go in an advertising based environment. The incentive is to create as much content as possible, to create as many impressions as possible that incentivizes a company to post about things first before there's actually necessarily the fact has been established. But then we say to ourselves, oh, subscription based is better. Well, no, subscription based maybe is a better, more predictable cash flow from a business perspective. But from a societal perspective, one, you make everything subscription, all of a sudden content is no longer democratized. And two, now your goal is to retain your audience. If you have an audience that generally identifies with certain political beliefs or XYZ beliefs, well, you're going to have writers who write in ways that align with those beliefs. So I just think there's a there's still a misincentive of the business model to just create good factual shit that are not it that is not editorialized. Yep. All right, man. How can people find you, Morning Brew, your podcast? How can people get in touch? Well, uh, first of all, if you're a Twitter person, you can follow me on Twitter at Business Barista. But overall, I would just say, if, you know, if any of what I've talked about in kind of the journey of, of building a business or a career has resonated with you, uh, that's what my whole podcast is about. Founders Journal, it's all about how to build a great career or build a great business. Um, three days a week, 15 minute episodes, quick and snackable like the brew. So I would say just check out the the podcast and see what you think. Worst case scenario, you've given up 15 minutes of your life. Best case scenario, you found something that you're going to spend way more than 15 minutes on. I love it. All right, man. Thank you so much. Um, I will be in touch. And this this episode was, this was really fantastic. This was way better than I expected. So Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed this. Thanks, Alex. everyone. It's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please follow the show on Apple, Spotify, or subscribe on YouTube. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and chairman of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.